God, thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, that you don't leave us alone, that you don't leave us as orphans, but you, you send us your helper, our helper, our advocate, and we're grateful. May we love you more than we did when we walked in because we know you more. Amen. If you're, first, if you're new with us, we are in the midst of a series in John, the Gospel of John. We are uh, over halfway through, and we'll finish in September. So um, we're in John 14, and the, the context is important because Jesus just laid out some things, and he, he goes on and he continues. So while we stop week to week, Remember that this is one conversation that Jesus had. I mean, from, from John 14, 13, John 13, 14, to the, to the crucifixion is a couple hours. And for us, it's going to be months that we're looking at this. But John 14, 14 says, Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And after this promise, immediately after this promise, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, that seems kind of strange, doesn't it? If you, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. How do those things go in one conversation, in one dialogue? See, the, the promise that Jesus gives to do anything that we ask him is actually tied to the Holy Spirit. Tied to the giving of the Holy Spirit. Because obedience is something, it's a, it's a piece, it's a part of what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Remember we talked last week how praying in Jesus' name was not some magic word or, or thing that you put at the end of a prayer. It's, a, it's in essence a lifestyle. It's something that we do. It's how we live. We, we pray according to the will of Jesus and part of that is obedience. And so obedience is directly tied to what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Because you can't manipulate God into doing whatever you want. Right? He's, not, he's not the genie in a bottle. And we're not Aladdin. Right? Where we just rub the bottle and, and he comes out and we says, all right, Jesus, here's what I would like. I would like a nice new F-250. I mean, I'd settle for a F-150, but if you can do anything, I'd like to have an F-250. And I would like it to have four-wheel drive, and I would like it to have leather seats. And right, that's, not, that's not what it means. That's not what Jesus is saying. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He's not a genie. We can't manipulate him into doing whatever he wants for our benefit. And so Jesus takes it, and he puts a direct connection between love and obedience, See, part of loving is our obedience. We can't love God without obeying him. It's impossible. It's a slap in the face to say, Jesus, I love you, but I'm going to do everything opposite of what you say. That's not love. We cannot say that we love him and act contrary to him. Now, this isn't simply the thou shalt not that Jesus talks about. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. No, it's, it's all of life. What does it mean to love Jesus, to live for him, to give ourselves to him? It's a whole lifestyle. It's not just following a list of rules. It requires all of us at all times. His commands are the entire scope of his teaching. It's everything about him. He's our example of what it means to submit to the Father. Remember that everything Jesus did was in submission to the Father. He obeyed the Father in everything. He's an example to us of that. He shows us the way. He shows us how. In John 6.29, Jesus says that to believe him... To obey him is to believe him. John 6, 29. Jesus answered him, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. What is the work of God? What is obedience? Believing. Not just mere assent. It's not just saying, oh yeah, I believe. Let's go. No, you believe by showing your actions. 
So Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. As, as Emily pointed out, this, this is not works-based. It's not, if you obey my commands, I will love you. If you do what I say, I will love you. See, love precedes obedience. We obey because we love. We obey because we are loved. See, obedience without love is pharisaical. It's dangerous. It won't ever lead you to God. It won't ever lead you to Jesus. But love without obedience is impossible. So obedience without love is pharisaical and will actually condemn. But love without obedience is also dangerous and leads to condemnation. When we disobey, when we do things that we are not supposed to do, it's because we're actually loving ourselves more than we're loving him. Think about Eve in the garden. When the serpent came to her and said, did God really say that you shouldn't eat of that fruit? You're not going to die. God's holding something back from you. Eve, you deserve it. You deserve to know the difference between good and evil. Eve, you deserve it. Eve, you know better than God. And so Eve says, you know what? I, that fruit is pleasing. God must be holding something back from me. That's why we disobey. Because we're loving ourselves more than we're loving him. We think that we know better than him. And so we succumb to the lies that Eve believed. God is withholding something from us. So we think that we know something better than God does. We think that God is holding something back. And in my actions, by what I do, I show that I love myself and I trust myself more than I trust God. Do you love Jesus? The way that you answer that question is by saying, answering, are you keeping his commands? Does your life reflect what you say you love? I love Jesus. Does your life reflect it? That's Jesus' point. Right, kids, you know this. One of the ways that you show your parents you love them is by obeying them, is by doing what they say. And when you don't do what they say, it is a sign of unlove. It is a sign of disrespect. It is a sign of, I know better than you, and I'm not going to submit myself to you. We, we did this as kids. We do this as kids. We do this as employees. Right? For, for parents, we get this too. Few things make us feel unappreciated and unloved by our kids as when they don't believe, when they don't obey. So imagine yourself in God's shoes. It's the same thing. It's not possible to obey with, or it's not possible to love without obedience. And so immediately after Jesus talks about obedience, immediately after Jesus talks about love, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right? All of us on our own would be sitting there saying, well, what do I do? Like, I, I want to be able to keep God's rules. I, I'm not capable. I, I know my own heart. I know who I am. I am not capable of keeping God's commands. So what hope is there for me? So immediately after this, Jesus promises to send another helper. I'm going to send you another helper. How is this connected with love and obedience? You and I, all of humanity, are unable to keep God's commands on our own. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. I can't keep my commands, your commands. Don't worry, I'm sending you a helper. I'm sending you one, an advocate. I'm sending you someone who will walk beside you, who will help you to do this. See, in order for us to keep the commands of God, we have to be changed on the inside. It's not just about outward actions. The goal of Christianity is not to change your actions. It's not to change what you look like on the outside. It's to change who you are on the inside, and that will reflect on your outside. This is the point. It's not behavior modification. It's heart transformation. And so he sends the Holy Spirit. He sends the helper to transform us and change us. 
on the inside. And that gives us the ability to obey. That gives us the ability to love. The helper is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. But notice that Jesus has another helper. Isn't that interesting? And here's what John wrote in 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is our helper. Jesus is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He is advocating. He is interceding for us on our behalf. He's a helper. He was a helper to the, to the apostles, the disciples, because what was he doing? He was walking with them. He was teaching them. He was beside them. He spent three years with them in everything. He was their helper. He is their helper. But Jesus, I'm going to send you another helper. I'm going up to the Father, and I'm sending you another helper, the Spirit of Truth. And this Spirit of Truth will actually be with you because he will be in you. See, the, the Spirit is not a, a passive helper. He's not sitting there twiddling his thumbs, saying, oh, I'm just waiting for you to ask for help. I'm here. I'm here. I'm waiting. He's not, he's not that. He's, he's active. He's not passive. He guides people in the truth. He guides us to Jesus. He guides us to the fullness of Jesus. He points us to Jesus. I mean, think about the things Jesus did with the disciples. He, he taught them, he led them, he walked with them, he empowered them. These are some of the things that the Spirit does for us on a much greater level. I mean, how many times have you sat there and thought, man, I wish, I wish I could walk with Jesus. I mean, I wish, like how different would my life be if I would walk with Jesus? But Jesus told the disciples, it's, it's actually better for you if I go. Why? Because I'm going to send the Spirit. And the Spirit, the same Spirit that indwelt Jesus and raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that indwells us. And he says, it's actually better for you if I go so the Spirit will come. But he's the Spirit of truth. See, truth is vitally important. Jesus is the truth. You can't worship God apart from the truth, which is why obedience is so important. Because obedience is living according to the truth. If you disobey God, if you are living according to a lie, you are not living according to the truth. Rules aren't just rules because God made them on a whim, right? The Trinity was not sitting down saying, all right, what should our rules be for this new universe that we're making? Like, let's think about the law of gravity. Let's start there because I feel like that's important. Otherwise, we'd all be floating around. So gravity, we got that. We have to think about some, all right, so how does this work? Right, this wasn't the Trinity. That's not, they weren't, they weren't sitting down making rules because they were just making rules. That's not how it went. The commands of God reflect the original creation. It was all created to, to live in accordance with God's character. And so when we say God's commands we actually reflect his character. The commands of God reflect the character of God. So he doesn't say submit just because he thinks that that's a fun thing to do to mess with people. He says submit because Jesus submits to the Father. It's reflecting of the Trinity. The Trinitarian relationship is reflected in our very marriages. Submit to one another as Christ submits to to the Father. It's a reflection of who he is. So when we see the laws, the commands of God, it actually shows us who God is. And this is why what the Pharisees did was so destructive. Their goal in their mind was to build a hedge around the Torah, a hedge around the laws, so that way you could never see the law. Because if you never saw the law, you could never break the law. It's a nice theory, 
But what actually happened is they never saw who God is. They never saw God for himself because they were so busy trying to keep people away from the law because they thought it was all about outward actions when it's actually about worship. And a fascinating way that this played itself out is that the name Yahweh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history here, so don't fall asleep, but ancient Hebrew had no vowels. They just knew how to say it. because the, So it didn't have any vowels. So at some point, it was around two or 300 BC, they actually, there's a group of people that actually started adding vowels in. But the name Yahweh was to be so protected that they took the vowels that they added to the name Adonai and put it on Yahweh. So the actual spelling of Yahweh is very different than it's pronounced. Because in their minds, you can't misuse the name of God if you don't actually know the name of God. Well, what does that do? That actually prevents you from knowing the name of God. It actually prevents you from knowing him. So, so the rules of God reflect who he is, his character. Jesus is truth. Do not expect to worship Jesus apart from the truth. Do not think you can worship Jesus apart from the truth. He is truth. And the devil is a liar. And there's no truth in him. So if you worship apart from the truth, you are actually worshiping according to the devil. So people love to talk about and think about spiritual warfare. Like we get this, this great vision of angels with swords and they're going after each other like it's, it's King Arthur and the round table and they're all fighting each other and, and maybe a couple of them have bows and arrows and of course none of them have Uzis or anything like that because it's all mythical and so they all have swords. That's what we think of spiritual warfare. Swords and medieval knights and wings and... But in reality, spiritual warfare is as simple as the world celebrating lies and rejecting the truth. Spiritual warfare is, is saying that this lie over here is true. Spiritual warfare is saying that there is no truth. Jesus is, is truth. So we know there's truth, but the world says, eh, whatever. Whatever. Spiritual warfare is much more, is much less fantastic than angels with swords. It's saying that there's, that gender is whatever you want it to be, that there's no truth in that, that God's creation, he made the male and female is a lie. That's spiritual warfare. We worship the truth, the truth, capital T, truth. Jesus. And this is why the world cannot receive him. Where Jesus says, the world cannot see him because they don't know him. The spirit of truth. Why? Because he's truth. The world's rejected truth. The world can't accept truth. The world follows the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. Apart from the Holy Spirit changing us, we follow the devil, the, fa the father of lies. Why won't the world accept Jesus or the spirit of truth? Because it is led by the father of lies in whom there is no truth. The world sees the spirit as their enemy. The world sees Jesus as their enemy. And the world rejects all that he stands for because he stands for what is a reflection of him. And that is truth. And they cannot accept it. But, Jesus promised us, we know him. We know him, for he indwells us. He's with us and in us. Now, this is a fascinating thing. He reveals himself to us. We know him because he reveals himself to us. We know him because he indwells us. Notice it doesn't say he indwells you because you know him. What comes first? He indwells us. He's with us. The Spirit is always with us. He brings himself to us, and we are never alone. He's with us, and he's in us. We know that he is with us because he is in us. We are where he dwells. Remember the, the temple in the Old Testament was where, where God physically manifested himself, and he came down, and he indwelled the temple. That is now you and me. Read the description 
of the, of the majesty of the temple of the Old Testament. That's you. That's me. That's, we are where the Spirit of God dwells. See, all this talk about leaving that Jesus was given, he, he was telling them over and over again he's leaving, but then he promises that he would not leave them as orphans. I mean, imagine the, what the disciples are thinking. They're walking through, they're going through, and they're going through life, and they think that Jesus is, like, they are stoked about what's going to happen, right? He's going to sit on the throne of Israel, and they're ready to sit. And then he says, well, by, hey, guys, by the way, I'm leaving. And you can't come. And so they're, but don't worry, guys, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. First, right, Jesus would come back. He would come back to the disciples, after he was crucified, he was resurrected, and he went to the disciples. They weren't left without him. He didn't, he didn't leave them at the crucifixion. He came back with them. But this time back with the disciples wasn't permanent. It was a short period of time. After which he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. But he says, look, you'll see me. Don't worry, you'll see me because I live. You'll see me because I live. And because I live, you also will live. He will be resurrected. That's why they would see him again. See, Jesus knew what was happening. He willingly gave himself up on the cross. Nobody took his life from him. It's not like he was here and then things went bad and, and they went from bad to worse and he ended up on the cross. He gave himself willingly. He knew the end of the story. So don't, don't worry, disciples. You live because I live. He knew the end. He knew the plan all along. He made it with the Father before the foundation of the world. And he was preparing himself and the disciples for his imminent death. Yet, remember that he is the life. He is the life. Life cannot be taken from him. He is the giver of life. And so Jesus puts death in its proper perspective. See, physical death is a temporary separation from our body. We are not spirits with bodies. We are not bodies with spirits. We are body and spirit together. And so death, physical death, is a separation of the physical body from our spirit. So the moment we die, our spirit ascends. If you are a follower of Jesus, we are immediately with Jesus. Our bodies are in the ground. At some point, our bodies will be resurrected to be with him. And our spirits and our bodies will be reunited, and we will be given new bodies, which I'm very thankful for, especially the older I get. And I'm at that point where I grunt when I stand up or sit down. which I, like I, It just happened. I don't know why that is. But that won't be the case with our new bodies. It won't be the case. We will be given new. Because he lives, we also will live. See, life is more than just a physical heartbeat. It doesn't end when our hearts stop beating. But it's also more than, than just a spiritual experience. We are physical and spiritual beings. We will be resurrected. But the moment you believe in Jesus, you are given eternal life. Eternal life is not something that you will have. Is something that you do have. You do have eternal life. And while the physical body may die, Jesus says, you live because I live. I conquered sin and death. I walked out of the grave. What do you have to worry about? You live because I live. So in verse 20, he says, in that day, in that day, at the resurrection, it will be clear that Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in him. It will be clear when he walked out of the grave, it was clear that what he said was true and right. That he had power over sin and death. And our relationship with him, with Jesus, is a picture of what Jesus' relationship is like with the Father. The way that he loves us, the way that we love him, it's a, it's a picture of Jesus with the Father. This does not mean that we're on equal footing with Jesus. But the point of this is the closeness of the relationship. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have life in him. Jesus' love of the Father is given to us. 
His righteousness is given to us. His perfect obedience is given to us. So when the Father looks at us, he sees perfect obedience completed on, by Jesus, but by us through Jesus. His righteousness is given to us, and our sins are given to him. So when the Father sees Jesus, he sees my sin, and he sees it paid for. What an amazing gift we have. You live because I live. See, hear this. Believing is not just a mental assent. Believing is not just saying, oh yeah, I believe. I believe. What does, what does James say in James 2? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith? What good is it if somebody says he believes but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Can a faith without works save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled. Without giving them things needed for the body, what good is that? It's like when people put on Facebook, I'm sending you good vibes. I don't have any idea what that means. Like, I don't know. I'm sending you good vibes? You feel that? Isn't that? Like, but it's, just, it's what Paul it's, or James is saying here. What good is it if somebody says, I'm hungry and cold? I hope you get warmed up and eat. Peace. And they were like, no. What good is it if you say you believe but you don't have any works? So also, faith by itself, if it, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by what I by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe. But at least they shudder. At least they have an impact. Do what do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart work from works is useless. Again, this does not mean that you have to have works to be saved, but what James is saying and what Jesus is saying is that if you say you believe and you don't have any impact on your life, you don't believe. You're actually believing a lie. It's not about following rules. It's about the, the will of or the way of life. See, the expectation is that if we have his commands, we will keep them. If we know who he is, we will do it. The one who loves Jesus will be loved by the Father. This does not mean, now hear this, this is important. Because Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This sounds an awful lot like, if you love me, the Father will love you. If you love me, you have to love me, and if you do, then the Father will love you. See, love is a mark between the relationship of the Father and the Son. And so loving the Son inherently means loving the Father. And being loved by the Son inherently means being loved by the Father. They are one. And so the believer's life is to reflect that of Jesus. It's Complete obedience to the Father. Jesus is not saying if you do these things, then and only then will the Father love you. If you do these things, then and only then will I love you. The believer's life is to reflect that of Jesus, complete obedience to the Father. We obey because we love. We obey because he first loved us. John 14, or John, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. This is how it works. God's love precedes our love for him. His love for us precedes our love for him. We cannot, we cannot earn his love. We cannot earn his favor. We cannot earn his grace. That is not how it works. His love for us creates in us a desire to love him and obey him. But God's love also 
follows ours. See, he loved us, and he will love us. He always loves us, but he will love us specially. How does this work? He rewards us for our love and our obedience by showering us with his love. Jesus also promises his love. It's tied with the Father. So if we love Jesus, if we follow his commands, the Father will love us. The Father will shower us with his love in special ways. Not because we've earned it, but because he's a gracious, generous, loving God. Jesus promises his love. His love is shown to us in the carnation of the cross. He, we can't say, Jesus can't say, if you follow me, then I will love you. He loved us by dying on the cross. He loved us and showed us his love way before you or I were ever even thought of. Yet his love is also given to us after obedience to him. Again, it's a graciousness and generousness of Jesus. This does not mean that when you sin, he stops loving you. It means that, that we love and obey because he gives us the ability to do so. If you love me and keep my commands, I will love you. How do I love you and keep your commands? I give you the ability to do so. I give you the Holy Spirit. We love because he loved us. We are able to do so because he gives us the Holy Spirit. His love for us precedes anything that we can do. We cannot obey on our own. But his love shows us the Trinitarian love. The Father and the Son give their love to each other, a perfect union. They perfectly love each other. Their love is given to us and is reflected in our obedience to him, which we are able to do because of the Spirit who enables us. It's very complex. It's, I feel like I'm teaching math up here. But we... We love him because he loved us. We are able to love him because he gives us the ability to love him because of the spirit of truth that he gives us. We do not have a faith that says do to be. We do not have a faith that says do this and be loved by God. We have a faith that says do because you're loved. Rest in that and rest in him. Jesus, thank you that you love us, that there is nothing that we can do to earn your love. There is nothing we can do to make you love us more or to make you love us less, but you love us perfectly because of who you are. May we remember that every day of our lives. Amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.